clearly with exchange programs, there's already existing processes of how you select students and at what point you know they apply to go on exchange. We've piggybacked off some of those, but really um, we've had to develop whole bunches of new processes and procedures from scratch because this is really quite a unique program. Um, when do the students apply? When are we identifying? What evidence do we have that they're ready to go? Um, it's different uh, than, than a standard exchange arrangement. And I would say one of the biggest things that Neil and I have had to do uh, is make sure that this program is embedded and understood widely across the university. G'day and welcome to Global Horizons. I'm your host, Rob Malicki, coming today from Ghana land at the AIEC conference in Adelaide. And my guests today have been working on an incredibly interesting project. And one of these projects that you may have heard about in international education, but not had a lot of experience with. We're talking today about dual degrees, international dual degrees. And my guest today, Simon Davis Burrows from Edith Cowan University, well-known figure in Australian international ed, and Neil Weston from the University of Portsmouth. Gents, thanks for joining me on Global Horizons. Thanks very much. Hey, day, Rob. Simon... Maybe we can just start with you. Can you just give us like a really brief introduction into what a dual degree is and basically how they work? Oh, thanks, Rob. So a dual degree program is where students study at one institution and then uh, at a point in the degree go overseas or in, you know, interstate or wherever and undertake study at another institution. Um, our degrees at, at, at ECU and the University of Portsmouth, uh, students do the first two years at their home university, and then they go on a compulsory year exchange to the partner university before returning back to the home university to finish off their degree. So we've got six dual degrees now um, between the organisations, uh, with a seventh on the way. And Neil, maybe you can tell us a little bit about the background of how this, this relationship between, like, let's use this as a case study, ECU... Portsmouth, how this one came about? Yeah, I think it was really driven from the top, really. Our, both our vice chancellors were keen to develop the dual degrees. They saw the synergy between both institutions around our subject portfolio, as well as our kind of ranking, our history, our values, and the like. And so we started with a memorandum of understanding in 2018, moved into student exchange uh, fairly soon after that for 10 mobility places across both institutions and then signed an agreement to set up uh, the dual degrees, of which we started with three dual degrees in 2020. Is that right? Yeah, 20, 21, sorry, 21. Um, and that's how it evolved, and, and essentially it's grown uh, arms and legs from then. As soon as people found out about th this kind of offering, other su subject areas were really keen to explore it and discuss with colleagues at both institutions to try to create a course that was going to be meaningful to the students, they were going to get a great deal out of the experience, both culturally and academically, and that would enhance their employability prospects after completing the degree. Because the unique thing about the dual degree also is that the, the students, upon graduating from the degree, get a, a degree certificate from both institutions, one from ECU and one from University of Portsmouth. It really is a fabulous model, and you know it's one that's been around for, for many years, but what I've observed in the industry over the years is that it, it's been largely driven in Australia by recruitment. So institutions recognising qualifications from other countries and then having students uh, come in and have that recognition and then shortcutting essentially through to a bachelor's or master's program here in Australia. But what you folks have developed is, is really collaborative and the numbers were great. Do you want to talk a little bit about numbers that are sort of currently moving on this program? Because it's a genuine exchange of students. Yeah, thanks, Rob. Uh, at the moment, right now, October 2023, uh, we have... 270 odd students studying across both universities. We expect that number will grow. Uh, in, by 2025, we could have as many as 500 students. I think the other thing to note is uniquely uh, for, our, for our students is that they pay their tuition fees to their home university only. So the way that we've set the program up is it's a true exchange. It's an exchange model that is reciprocal. Um, we have built-in ways to try and keep those balances managed between our institutions. We monitor them and we've set course quotas depending on demand. And that can be adjusted if we need. You know, if both universities are seeing demand in an area, we can agree to adjust it up. Um, but likewise, if, if there's too much demand, we can adjust it down. Can we get in bit into the nuts and bolts a bit? Um, 
what are the degrees that are, or the subject areas, discipline areas that you guys are, have, are covering off as part of these dual degree programs? Neil? Uh, so we've got six uh, that are up and running already. So we've got global uh, communications and media. We have a, a cyber crime course as well. We have a sport exercise science course. We have a sports management course. We have a course in biomedical science. Uh, and we also have a course in environmental science uh, and we have uh, a psychology dual degree that's due to start next year as well, undergraduate level. So that's you know essentially what we've been trying to create. As I say, there's been a good buzz uh, with the, the staff and the students have really embraced the opportunity as well. And uh, we have our first cohorts that are on their mobility experience at, as we speak. Some uh, 18 students in ECU currently and we've got students coming from ECU that have joined us in September and will also join us in January too. It seems like a pretty condensed timeline to me, honestly, like knowing how slow universities can sometimes be, but to have, and particularly in the area of academic um, qualifications, and yet within the space of essentially three years since you've done the exchange agreement, you've managed to match these degree programs and already have significant numbers of students. Can we talk about that process of getting this approved at both of your institutions. I'll throw to Neil to actually say a few things on this in a moment, um, but essentially each of the dual degrees are modelled off an existing single degree. But actually matching the curriculum, doing that unit to unit or module as they're called at Portsmouth, module to module uh, matching, has been really quite a bit of work. So the course coordinator and the course lead from very early on sat down and looked at the structure and what we were trying to achieve and where there would be complementarity in the actual units that the students are studying. So the exciting part of the degree is that not only do they do more, they do deeper and broader learning than they would if they stayed in the single degree only. Neil? I think one of the key things is, is they're learning from experts from two different sides of the world. If you, th you think of environmental science as an ex example, uh, these students are coming out with a unique understanding of environmental science in two parts of the world. They're maybe engaging with uh, different environments, uh, going on field trips, maybe engaging with different employers in those two, two different regions as well, which makes them uh, that much more employable after they've completed their degree. So I think one of the th critical things for us was to ensure that the student's journey was a smooth one. So we didn't want to set students up to fail in the sense of doing your two years at ECU, then you go over to University of Portsmouth, it's a completely different curriculum assessment and, and you really struggle. And you know it's bad enough going to a different country uh, and studying in a different environment uh, if your modules are completely different as well. So it's really careful planning on behalf of the course leaders um, to make sure that that journey is effective, both from a content perspective, but also from an assessment journey perspective as well. Who manages? It. On both sides, who manages the programming and like movement of students, academic side? Like, tell me about that. So, so we've got a governance structure within uh, across the partnership. Um, so we have a strategic board that is chaired by our deputy vice chancellor in internationals on both sides, and it meets twice yearly and involves Simon and myself, executive deans from the schools and faculties, as well as those two uh, senior members of staff. Um, and then we have an operations group meeting that meets every uh, two, two months. That's chaired by Simon and myself, and it has all the dual degree uh, course leaders on there. And then uh, we bring in professional services staff from right across the university, as is required in terms of the agenda. And the minutes and actions from those are fed into our existing committee structures within each institution. So we have, and we've also created a partner handbook, which is an extensive document that details every aspect of the student's journey from marketing and admissions all the way through to degree classifications um, to try to detail exactly who does what and when um, to ensure that it is good a good journey for the staff and the students that are involved. So we've invested a lot of time to make sure that we've, um, that we've set it up and structured it um, in the best possible way. And I'd also just add to that is clearly with exchange programs there's already existing processes of how you select students and at what point you know they apply to go on exchange. We piggybacked off some of those but really um, we've had to develop whole bunches of new processes and procedures from scratch because this is really quite a unique program. Um, when do the students apply? When are we identifying? What evidence do we have that they're ready to go? Um, it's different uh, than, than a standard exchange arrangement. And I would say one of the biggest things that Neil and I have had to do uh, is make sure that this program is embedded and understood 
widely across the university from all those areas Neil mentioned, from marketing, from, from the recruitment team, um, from the admissions team, from our study overseas that manage the placement and make sure that they're going through the same existing processes. That has actually taken quite a bit of work, but because it's been led from the top, everybody understands the importance of the partnership, the strategic partnership for both universities, and so have got behind the project and you know built this in on top of everything else they're already doing in a busy mobility office. Tell me more about areas. that, gents, about that process of bringing people along because we all know that inside institutions, it's hard. Let's face it, it's hard to get the word out. It's hard to get things prioritised. So what have you done? What have been some of the wins that you've had in terms of those processes of getting the word out. Yeah, I think one of the things we, we uh, focused on with, our, with our, well, our staff right across the university was to ensure that they understood just the life-changing experience these students would be gaining and what their part in that process of creating that life-changing experience for that student. So that was really important in terms of getting them engaged, but also then empowering them to understand their part in the jigsaw work to make it a good experience for, for the students. So that was really really important. One other thing that we did as well was we invited professional service staff and academics to come and meet with the students um, or who were going to do the dual degree course so they could just uh, mingle and chat with them and understand the excitement and the energy that was coming from the students because they can then recall that and remember that. So when you ask them, you send an email and can you, can you just make sure that that's done by X date? They, you know, they've got that in the back of their mind and they're more likely to then uh, engage with it and, and do it for you. So we haven't had any additional uh, staffing resources for this um, endeavor we have been asking people to take it on um, within their existing workloads so that engagement piece with the, st the staff has been really important and I would just add to that that we've actually been very fortunate you're fortunate to have no resources <laughs> Mr Davies Burrows you're the most optimistic person in this industry well very fortunate to have some really uh, motivated academic staff who've gone above and beyond out you know out of hours to do that mapping to work, but they, they enjoy, I mean, much of the work to develop, certainly the first four courses happened during COVID. And so everyone was familiar and used to team. Time zones aren't too bad between um, Portsmouth and, and, and ECU in Perth. We've got about seven hours time difference. So afternoon meetings are early morning. We can jump on, you know, early afternoon and Portsmouth staff can get up a little bit earlier and do their dual degree discussions. So we've been very fortunate in the people that are involved in the project. And as Neil said, they've come along for the ride. I had a, a celebratory event when all of the, dual, the year three exchange year students arrived at Portsmouth. And we had a hundred plus people in the room, executive deans, deputy vice chancellor, vice chancellor, plus the students. And the students were the center of attention. They all got a little pin to acknowledge and, and welcome, um, welcome them. And they only get that pin when they've arrived in country. So it's something to work towards and we'll set them apart from from, from other students. I think uh, one of the other critical aspects that we've invested a lot of time in is that year two. So when those students are preparing for the, for coming out to, to Australia or going out coming to the UK. So our students come over to ECU to start in July. And right from the start of their second year in September, we have an induction program with them. So a pre-arrival induction program with them where we cover off all the elements of them going over there. So it'll be visas, it'll be flights, it'll be accommodation. It will be their learning experience. It will be the assessment journey they're likely to be on. And we will then draw from staff at the other institutions. So the accommodation office, the study abroad office at ECU, um, people from the visas, etc. will be coming on to a, a call uh, that, that we will record and then will be available for the students to then engage with uh, thereafter. Uh, and that's on both sides. So that important piece in the, the second year is really critical in helping to minimise the stress and anxiety around uh, transitioning. And then obviously when the students then arrive onto campus, they have international orientation and induction uh, and, and go on thereafter. And they also meet with their course leader from the other institution as part of that induction is a really important familiarisation and connection point as well. So guys, why did you pick the programmes that you ended up picking for dual degree? We had this idea of this, these dual degrees and we, we, we then made sure that we were disseminating across all of our different faculties. You know, this is something we're looking to set up. If you have course leaders that are interested in developing that opportunity, then come to us and have a conversation. Let's look at the course portfolio that's available at ECU and see whether uh, there is a synergy around the courses that are on offer. And if there are, we'll then connect you. Um, and so uh, Simon and myself would, would host a, an online call between the course leaders to initiate the conversation, to 
provide the structure around how it would work and, and on what we were needing from them. And then we would leave it to them to have a conversation, map out the different modules, and then come back to us with a proposal around what the core structure would look like. Um, but also what we wanted to do, and we asked those uh, course leaders to do, was we need to know there's a market for this. So you need to start asking uh, prospective students at open days, ask them about, you know, would they be interested in this? Is Australia a destination that you want to, to, to go to? Uh, as well as your current students, if this was an offer, would you have, would you have attempted to do that so that was really important to get that insight from the students to understand whether they are interested if the course leaders are interested and then we then take it there on so that's how it worked in Portsmouth anyway yeah and very similar at DCU same, same idea did you have to rewrite any of the degrees in order to facilitate these dual degrees so I think I mentioned that the each of the dual degrees at both universities have a linked single degree so we are built from existing courses but each of the courses have to go through, each of the new courses, the dual degrees, um, have to go through both universities in, you know, independent approval process. Um, we had to ensure that the course, the idea around the course approval was approved both at the school level, but then also at the you know, university level, so on and so forth. And it had to happen at, at both institutions. That process of moving between the two institutions was quite a complex process because who approves what first and how much approval do you need at ECU before you can put it through the approval um, process at, at Portsmouth. But it worked well and, you know, before we even can take a new course at ECU to the university for approval, it has to be approved by, at the Curriculum Teaching and Learning Committee within each of the schools that we have. And to do that, we need to know that there's a course, there's demand and so on and so forth. And that actually that unit map mapping has already been done because that first document that goes is this is what it's going to look like. But we did build some consistency. So every degree works in the same way. Two years at the home university, one year on exchange, and then return to the home university to finish your degree. And that helps having that consistency. Simon, you've just mentioned something very important, which is reciprocity and balance management. How are you guys, how are your institutions handling this? What we decided uh, at the strategic board level was that we would have a cap on intake numbers. Um, and that would be set at 20 to start off with. Um, but if there was a significant interest on both sides for a particular course, then that could be increased. Uh, so the cybercrime course is up to 30, the sports science course is up to 25, and they may increase. If they do wish to increase it, then it needs to go to the strategic board to agree upon that. Um, but there is the capacity to do that. Um, and the idea being that across all the courses, we were hoping there was going to be a relatively equal balance, which there is just now, um, across all courses. And there were maybe nuances between the different course subject areas, but across the overall partnership with that capping would help to, to maintain that reciprocity. Also, I'll add to that is it's very similar to the standard student exchange agreement management. You can't possibly expect that this degree would be balanced in the first two years of operation because we've, you know, we've seen some attrition in those first two years. So we can't map uh, you know, numbers to numbers to be exactly the same, but we've looked at this at the course level and we'll continue to look at, at course to course, but also at the partnership level. So it may be there's slightly more demand in one course at Portsmouth, but that's balanced out by slightly more demand in another course at ECU. Can I just add just one other thing to that? So Portsmouth only recruits on a September intake, so we have one intake. Uh, whereas ECU, they have the January intake and then they have a, a July intake as well. So we're always, when uh, ECU are working towards their January intake, they already know what we've got in our September intakes, you know, three, three or four months before in, in advance. So they're always sort of slightly behind in terms of their recruitment, but they've got a good understanding for where we're positioned and therefore can adjust uh, accordingly. Yeah, so it's like this leapfrogging of numbers to some extent, like you're jumping over the top of the ECU balance and then they're jumping over, back over the top of you, yeah. And we've got the benefit of a, a second intake to top up, so we set the quota, but if there's spare places. And I think the other thing to note at ECU side is, and, and I think this is happening at Portsmouth, Neil, and, and you, what we've seen is that now we've got students studying in the dual degree, they're sitting alongside students in the single degree. They're talking, oh, I'm off to England in six months. Oh, really? Oh, what are you doing? And then there's conversations at the unit to unit, you know, I'm in this unit, and they're asking then, can you know, can I move into this this dual degree and that's happening at ECU particularly in the mid-year intake where we're seeing students that have had that first semester in the single degree and then want to move across and if there's space there's no problem for them moving across and of course they if they've done the right same units they'll get all the same credit and Neil the same thing's happening at it markets itself 
what we yeah, want. Yeah, yeah. So a question about money. How do you work out the financial side of things? Because obviously teaching degrees cost money and we need to balance that in some way. I think that's one of the unique things about the partnership we've, um, is that we have been connecting people right across the university in the different elements. So quality assurance, we're getting up the quality assurance people at Portsmouth and ECU to discuss the, discuss the regulations and the, the, the different structures and setups with that. From marketing point of view as well, you know, we've been connecting the marketing um, colleagues to, 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 to develop the collateral, to develop the films, uh, the student profiles, uh, the websites, uh, the marketing resources such that we can identify the USPs of each institution in order that we can get the message out as effectively as we can. And part of that is also, we haven't even started really on international recruitment. We have started to have a conversation around identifying our international regional recruiters and having conversations collectively about doing shared marketing for these dual degree programs and saying that you can start in the UK and, and go to, or you can do it the other way, or, other way around. So we have tried beyond just the academics and the course leaders to connect across the partnership and that's really important. Um, we're wanting a truly strategic partnership and from Simon on my perspective is we want to share best practice across all aspects of the university uh, and this this is a kind of vehicle to facilitate those conversations. Yeah. To me this feels like one of those such, such a future proofing mechanism for institutions. You know we've got this big shift in the way education is being delivered, marketing is changing everywhere, and students have more choice than ever before. So why would they pick A, university at all, and B, your university? And something like this is just so appealing. You know, two degrees with just a little bit of extra effort, plus the international study experience. It seems like a no-brainer in so many ways. <laughs> yeah, well, we think so. We're, we're, we're the champions. I mean, like, it's the sort of thing that I would have done. I'm sure all of us in, in this little meeting room now, if you knew that was there and you could do it with a little bit of extra effort, and not only do you get that international, you know, so you, you get the cross-cultural or intercultural communication, um, those cross-cultural skills, because you're living, working, doing something in, a, in another part of the world, but... I think from Neil and I, the employment opportunities. You know, we always say to students that go on exchange, you know, don't talk about, you know, when you put it on your CV, don't talk about where you went, talk about what you learned and what you've gained from this experience. Well, what a wonderful thing to be able to put, you know, on your CV. I've not only studied in another part, you know, in the UK for an ECU student, but I have a qualification from that university, from another university. And now I could potentially work in the job market in the UK or, or, or in Europe or beyond. You're future-proofing yourself as a student by selecting this course. Who knows where the jobs of the future are going to be? And the students also have access to all the student services at both institutions. So for employability, they have access. ECU students coming over to the UK have access to our employability service where they can start to have conversations around what opportunities there are in the UK for their subject area and vice versa. Our students can, can do likewise. And obviously being taught by experts in different sides of the world will help to uh, uh, broaden their networks and the potential for them to work thereafter. So, yeah, it's, it's quite exciting on that on that side. The other thing about the, the dual degrees is that, um, and the two universities, is that Edith Cowan and uh, University of Portsmouth are quite different in the in the environment in which the students are taught. So Portsmouth is, a, is, is on a peninsula in the south coast of England. There's two roads in and out. It's the gateway to Europe. Uh, it's 90-minute train, direct train to, to London. But it is a city centre campus. The student, the, the, the university is right in the middle of the city. You are a part of the community of the city, uh, an important part. Everything's within a 10 or 15 minute walking distance. Uh, but then also we have the south coast where, where you can walk down to the seafront and enjoy that seaside, uh, seaside sort of experience. Whereas you go to ECU and the Jindalup campus is really different to that of the Portsmouth one. So what the students have come back to and said that they're really enjoying the fact that it is a uniquely different learning uh, sort of environment in which they're being taught and they're getting a great deal from from the difference the different uh, experiences that they're getting which is really rewarding as well so neil tell me your story how did you end up in in this whole space well i'm actually a boy from glasgow um so i did my own no you weren't uh, uh, it's quite a soft accent uh, for a glaswegian i can assure you um but i i um, did my degree undergraduate degree at glasgow university four-year undergraduate degree in physiology and sports science and then i went on a stopped my studying and went over to australia and i did the whole east coast uh fruit picking uh life-changing experience over in, on australia uh, i have family over in australia and in sydney as well that i went to see as well and then i went back did a master's uh, and a phd at chichester university and then moved over to portsmouth in 2001 to become a lecturer in sport and exercise psychology and I've been there as I say since 2001 and moved into international education probably about four or five years ago uh, as associate dean uh, within our faculty of science and health 
um, and was really engrossed with the opportunities that it gave in um, for their students to go abroad and experience new cultures, new education, as well as you know the richness with which uh, a diverse range of students from all over the world can bring to the actual classroom at Portsmouth as well. I have great memories of, of teaching master's students, um, maybe 25 students in, in sports psychology master's program. And there's maybe about five or six of them from the UK. The rest of the students were from all across the world. And they were able to bring their stories and their background and their experiences from their different part of the world into the learning of the of this actual subject area. And that richness, that diversity really enhanced the learning of me as an academic, but also the students themselves. Do you have a particular student story, like an individual that stays with you? There's quite a few. We had a, a Japanese uh, female student that came across to do a master's in, in sports psychology. Uh, and she was a fabulous student, really attentive, really hardworking, really embraced the culture over here at, um, at Portsmouth and then she went back to, to Japan and she, she then ended up doing a PhD and now she's lecturing in the area that she, she was taught in and it was wonderful because she brought her family over for the graduation ceremony because our graduation ceremonies happen kind of because the master students they go from September to September so they've got to wait until the following July before they then graduate and so she, she came back over with her family and it was a wonderful experience to see her and her family and our mother and father were so delighted and uh, about the experience that she's had and it was you know life changing for her so that you know those memories those students that you teach really do make it worth its while the the, the effort you put into these types of activities how about you simon we've known each other a long time haven't we We both studied at the same university we know some of the same lecturers and the like yeah so my story is probably similar to neil's and and it's funny isn't it Rob, how many people who are involved in international education, particularly internationalisation, but in international ed in general, have lived, worked and studied in an overseas destination. So when I finished high school in Sydney, I went on and did an apprenticeship. So I'm a motor mechanic by profession with a post-trade diesel qualification. Um, And then I went off travelling. And I spent six years going around the world, mostly um, Europe, North America and South and Central America, And then when I uh, finished that travel, I had been exposed to so many different things. I I felt like I wanted to make a difference. And so actually I returned as a mature age student to uh, Macquarie and did a resource and environmental degree. And then went back to the UK thinking I would get a job in the, you know, environmental protection. You know, very passionate about that. But it didn't happen that way. I ended up working uh, at a uh, college in vocational education and training. And it wasn't even my degree that got me the job. It was the mechanics uh, qualification because they were looking for someone to assess and train uh, apprentices. And I got that job and from there went into, um, that was at the city of Bristol um, in, the, in, in the south and then went on to Strode College and ra- ran work-based learning. Returned back to Australia, went to UTS and worked in engineering. And then, as many will know, found it very difficult to afford to buy a house in Sydney. And Perth was looking good, and so I went over to Perth and, and started in international education back in 2005, and I've been there ever since, and love working in the field that I'm working in, which is internationalisation. And for anyone listening to this from overseas, Perth is honestly like the best city in Australia. Outdoor lifestyle, sunsets over the ocean, yeah, it's incredible. Yeah, and it's a city that's, you know, it's not as populated as other uh, cities, so you can still get around reasonably easy. And being a surfer, I like the idea that I can drive down and park at the beach and not have to pay a a parking fee. Not possible in Sydney. (laughs) Yeah, you've got good snorkelling, like uh, almost walking distance from your house. It's brilliant. Yeah, yeah, no, it's fantastic. Gents, thank you so much for your time on the podcast. That's been so insightful. And for anyone um, thinking of, you know, testing out this model, what would your final bit of advice be for them? Neil? I think you need uh, buy-in from the from the staff within the institution. You certainly need buy-in from the, the top of your institution, which was really important for us. As soon as that happens from the top of the institution and it filters all the way down, then you're on to a bit of a winner there. But also, I think you need to really canvas opinion from your students. Understand what your student body are wanting, if it's something that they're of interest, but also, where do they want to be mobile? You know, there's no point in setting up a, 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 a dual degree in uh, in Canada if people want to go somewhere else into Europe or whatever. So you need to uh, uh, discuss and, and speak to your students, understand the key stakeholder opinions, and then that will help to shape um, what you do moving forwards. But it is a it's a hard work, but it's a it's a really rewarding experience. Now go back to the, what I said earlier on around around seeing the joy and the excitement in the students 
uh, for the, the opportunity that you've created is, is, is fantastically rewarding and well worth it. Simon Davis Burrows, Neil Weston, thank you for joining me on Global Horizons. I hope you've enjoyed this deep dive episode of Global Horizons, really digging into the details of dual degrees and how they work. It's a fascinating model. I hope this has added some colour for you to an area of international education that maybe you haven't heard of before. And hey, is there an area that you would like to know more about? You can email me. My email address is rob at globalsociety.com.au. I'd love to hear from you. And remember to hit subscribe in your favourite podcast app. Until next time, I hope you have a great day. And this is Global Horizons. Have an awesome day. Global Horizons is a production of The Global Society, Australia's learning abroad support company. For more information about how we can support your learning abroad team, visit www.globalsociety.com.au. This episode was recorded on the Ngunnawal land in Canberra. We pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging. Have a great day.